Once again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. This is the second program in our new Wild Maine series with the Center for Wildlife Studies. And here tonight to tell you a little bit about the organization and to introduce our presenter is Jack Hopkins. Jack, go ahead, your turn, take it away. Thanks so much, Julia. Uh, before I introduce Allie, I wanna tell you a little bit about the Center for Wildlife Studies. So we're a Maine-based nonprofit organization. Our mission is to provide accessible environmental education and promote global wildlife conservation through science. In addition to conducting research all over the world, our faculty and staff train students and professionals around the globe, regardless of their financial position, to address the major environmental challenges of this 21st century, such as biodiversity decline, species extinction, climate change, and emerging threats to human and wildlife health. So today, as Julia said, we're continuing this Wild Main series. This is our new program, Adult and Community Education Series with the Camden Public Library. The purpose of this program is to educate you folks about the amazing natural resources we have here in the state. So following Allie's talk, please consider supporting our mission by giving a tax deductible donation to our organization, Center for Wildlife Studies. So now I'm super pleased to introduce Allie McKnight. She's an associate professor of wildlife and fisheries management at Unity College's hybrid learning program. She's a PhD graduate from the University of Maine, Orono in the Oncology and Environmental Science program where she studied the population ecology of seabirds, which is pretty fitting. I originally met Allie when I too was a wildlife professor at Unity College. In addition to her being a great colleague and friend at Unity, she's also a super talented and dedicated teacher and researcher. She's taught a dozen courses in her five-year tenure there, and nearly she's published nearly 20 peer-reviewed scientific publications, most of which are on seabirds, no surprise, and a few on green crabs, interestingly, which she studied for her master's at UMass Amherst. Tonight, Allie will discuss the importance of seabirds in terms of what they can tell us about our ocean health. Allie, take it away. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> All right, let me see if this works again to share my screen. Good. All right. And I can hide this thing up here. Um, let's see. There we go. All right, so hopefully everybody can see the slide yeah, now. Yeah. Yes, it good. looks good. Awesome. All right. So yeah, hi, I'm Allie. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, I'm here to talk to you, uh, like Jack mentioned, about marine birds and what kinds of things they can tell us about the ocean. Um, but first, if we were kind of in a face-to-face -face setting, um, I would be asking you to uh, look at this cover photo I have here um, and tell me what your reaction is. Um, and we can't really do that effectively online with 52 people. <laughs> um, but I imagine there are probably more than one of you out there that actually know and appreciate this uh, particular little seabird. And um, there might also be one or two of you who see this image and say, look, seagull. Uh, so I want you to kind of hold on to that reaction and we're gonna circle back at the end and um, see if you still think that. All right, so let me see if I can get to my next slide. There we go. All right, so um, I just wanna preview some of the takeaway messages that I have for you for this session. So um, it is maritime month. So I do wanna spend a little bit of time just kind of talking about marine ecosystems in general. And I want folks to walk away understanding that marine ecosystems are both incredibly important and also incredibly complex. Um, and marine birds can actually sometimes give us a good peek into the hidden workings of these systems. Uh, but only if we really understand what we're looking at and uh, sort of what the limitations are. All right, so some background on marine systems. So first off, most of the Earth's surface is covered by ocean, um, which you would know if you played around in Google Earth with your view of the planet. Um, this is, you know, actually one angle looking at our planet. You can see just how important water is to the surface of the Earth. So 71% of our planet's surface is covered by oceans. 
Um, 97 percent of the water on Earth is actually contained in the ocean. So there's only three percent of water uh, that exists as either surface water or is um, trapped up in the ice caps and glaciers. So um, the water itself is a huge component of the Earth's system. Um, it also provides some really important services, and I'll just name two here, uh, but it, about 70% of the oxygen in our atmosphere is actually produced by oceanic phytoplankton, so that's very important. Um, the oceans also store about 93% of the carbon dioxide in the biosphere, so another, another important feature. So marine systems are pretty important for life on Earth for these and other reasons. Uh, but before we go on, I want to uh, kind of make a nod to, you know, what is a marine system? What am I talking about here? Um, so how do we delineate marine ecosystems? We do it a little differently than we do terrestrial ecosystems. So in terrestrial systems, we often will use uh, the vegetation form as the defining feature of ecosystems. So for example, you can talk about a forest or a marsh or grassland, you're talking about the sort of primary vegetation growth form there. It's not as important in most marine ecosystems, uh, with some exceptions, uh, especially coastal systems. So we do have things like tidal marshes and eelgrass beds, um, but the vast sort of open ocean, we don't have, um, you know, a very visible vegetation type that we can define and delineate different ecosystems by. So what we end up doing, um, is we use physical factors, which are actually a little bit more important in structure, structuring marine ecosystems. So things like temperatures and currents and winds, salinity, nutrients, and various um, interconnections between these. Uh, and this is a fairly common um, way of looking at the different marine systems. These are the Longhurst biogeographical provinces. So you can see that um, there are defined sort of regions of the oceans, give or take, um, that we can think of as somewhat distinct systems. Uh, but then again, the ocean is an incredibly dynamic place. So it is actually really hard to pin these things down exactly. Um, so I just want to touch on some of the complexity here. We're not going to go over all of it, but we can start off with um, our major current systems, which may be familiar to, to some of you. So we can see um, there are these large circulating current systems in each of the uh, ocean basins. They travel clockwise in the northern hemisphere. They travel counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. Um, but in each case, they're bringing up the warm water from the equatorial regions up to higher latitudes and conversely bringing down cold water from the higher latitudes on the other side of the ocean. Um, and I always pause in this point when I'm talking to students and I point out that if anybody ever tries to convince you that um, you can also see this effect, which is a result of the Coriolis effect, right? Um, if somebody tries to convince you that this causes toilets to flush backwards in the southern hemisphere, you can tell them they're they're full of bunk. Um, that has, you know, Corio the Coriolis effect is something that happens over really large scales, and it's actually um, a consequence of the planet actually moving, spinning underneath the water mass, and that's not happening at the scale that you know your toilet is flushing. So um, you can you can bust that myth next time somebody tries to pull it out on. All right, so we've got these major current systems. We've also got some pretty important uh, physical things going on, namely uh, solar radiation, which we know provides the energy that fuels our food chains, and it also serves as you know, our source of heat. So we know um, that solar radiation warms equatorial regions more so than higher latitudes. So we can see these broad latitudinal patterns, but we can also see that they're modified by those currents we were just looking at. So again, warm water is being transported um, northward by the Gulf Stream here on the East Coast. And then it's uh, the Canary Current actually brings cold water down um, Europe over here. So we have these broad patterns, but again, they're, they're modified and, and made more complex because of the way the water is circulating. Um, if we zoom in and just look at what's going on in the currents, we can see they're not actually static features of the sort of landscape or the seascape. They're constantly shifting and moving, and we see some phenomena that are superficially um, 
similar to what happens with rivers in terrestrial systems. So here we can see oxbow and oxbow forming and this eddy gets pinched off. Um, so these are incredibly dynamic interfaces um, and we'll often get sort of these, like I said, these eddies um, that this particular one that's forming is trapping cold water um, and transporting it through the otherwise warm water. Up here we have warm water eddies and these actually serve as little microcosms. So they're actually trapping these warmer water organisms and providing them, um, I guess, habitat of a sort uh, for until the eddy dis dissipates or uh, rejoins the stream. So again, incredibly dynamic. And notice this is happening on the, over the course of days. Um, so it's you know happening on pretty fast time scales. We can also see this, another view of this, um, from infrared imagery that we collect uh, via satellites. So here again is the Gulf Stream traveling up the east coast of North America. We can see it's transporting quite a lot of warm water up. And we can see actually in the image the, these cold core rings and these warm core rings. Um, so that's pretty cool. And I also wanted to include this because it's a great example of the kind of oceanographic data that we can collect actually from space, which is super exciting. Um, so we have now a number of different satellite sensors that provide us with all kinds of awesome oceanographic data on things like you know temperature and chlorophyll content and um, other important things. One caveat is that these sensors can really only see and measure what's going on in the upper few millimeters of the water surface, if that. And also, in order to be able to sort of reliably um, calibrate and use these data, we do need to go out and, and basically ground truth or validate the data. And that involves getting out to different parts of the ocean, usually with boats. Um, and that can get pretty expensive. And I'm going to tie birds into this later on if you haven't caught my foreshadowing yet. So um, when I did some work in the Gulf of Maine doing some, some surveys a few years back, we chartered this relatively small research boat for a couple thousand dollars a day, if I remember. If you want to get out to the big water and really do some hardcore science, you're looking at $50,000 or a lot more per day um, of your research crews. So research vessels are incredibly expensive to use incredibly important um, and a good way to get the data, but uh, something, something we'll keep in mind as we get into talking about birds in a little bit. All right, so we just talked about how, um, you know, especially our satellite measurements are really measuring what's happening on the surface, but we know that in the ocean, most of what's going on is happening beneath the surface. And unfortunately, what we can see with our eyes is this, this blank blue slate. Um, but all the really exciting stuff is actually going on under the surface. So we talked about, you know, sort of the surface currents. Um, once we go down into the water column a little deeper, you can see that the physics get incredibly complex. Um, there's a lot going down, going on down there. Um, and that's also where a lot of the food chain is um, going on. So physical factors have huge influences on marine food webs. So um, these physical factors, uh, like the, the currents, the wind, solar energy, they really drive the layering and mixing and the movement of water masses. And those in turn affect the transport of energy and nutrients through the water column. And they, they therefore really kind of steer and shape key processes within the food web, in, including things that are pretty important to the human population. So again, that's all kind of happening beneath the surface. All right, so the fact that we have a harder time observing what's going on beneath the surface has been problematic in a lot of ways, but this is a really a, probably a familiar example to folks. And that is um, how we can manage to harvest marine resources sustainably. So when I talk about sustainable harvest, I'm talking about um, harvesting fish or other resources at a high enough rate to meet the demands of our global population. And um, marine resources are hugely important, uh, especially providing food for the population globally. Uh, but we also wanna harvest at a low enough rate to ensure steady future supplies. Um, and We've made a lot of attempts to do that. We've been getting better at it, arguably. Um, but we do have a lot of these cases where um, we overfished stocks and 
and essentially caused them to collapse. So this is just a, an example from our region. So this graph depicts the collapse of Atlantic cod um, off the east coast of Newfoundland. So you can see there's a pretty tremendous population crash that occurred in the 90s, um, at least partially as a result of overfishing. Um, and this wasn't for, for lack of trying to manage responsibly. Um, but one of the problems is that the life cycles of marine organisms can be, surprise, pretty complex, just like the environment that they live in. So just thinking about fish, for example, we know fish go through a number of stages. We have the adult fish that are spawning, they're producing eggs. Um, the eggs turn into embryos, grow into larvae, grow into juvenile fish, um, often several stages of juvenile fish. It may be several years or more before these eggs actually turn into reproducing members of the adult population. And at each stage of this life cycle, um, the, the fish, the eggs, the embryo, the larvae, uh, they have different environmental needs, they have different predators, they have different prey, they have different competitors. So at every life stage, there are sort of different things that can affect them. And one really cool thing about um, aquatic systems, this is a little aside, is that it's possible um, to be somebody's prey at one of your earlier life stages, but then as you grow, you may end up being the predator of that same uh, species later on. And that's something we don't see too often in terrestrial systems, just because the food chains don't tend to be as long. Um, but it's, you know, another interesting complexity in, in marine resources. All right. So, um, like I said, we, we often have a pretty good handle on what's going on with the sort of the spawning population of adults. Um, historically, we haven't had as great an idea of what's going on in these other life stages. And again, it can be several years before eggs turn into reproductive adults. This is something we're, we're getting better at. Um, and I'm obviously going to be talking about how birds can help us understand this, but they're definitely not the only um, tool that we have. There are plenty of, you know, fisheries independent type surveys that um, can help us get a handle on this as well. Um, but historically, um, sometimes we wouldn't know that a particular year class of eggs um, was, was a bust until we tried to harvest them as, a, as adults. And that's one factor that would lead to overfishing. Um, again, not for lack of trying to be responsible, just for lack of information. Um, and this uh, knowledge gap, I guess, it was actually the inspiration for the development of the entire science of fisheries oceanography. It was all about trying to solve this question about, um, you know, how to predict recruitment of fish based on um, oceanographic data and other, other things. So big problem um, that has plagued us. All right. So given all this, can marine birds help us shed light on this and other problems? So before I get into how birds relate to what I've been talking about, um, I wanted to give a little background on birds because I don't know, um, there are probably some folks out there that don't know a whole lot about birds. Um, so I wanna spend a few minutes just going over some basics. So one, I guess the theme of birds is that they have evolved very specifically for flight. Um, that's driven almost every aspect of the evolution of birds is this need for flight. Um, so I often tell my students, I quote Lightning McQueen, and I tell them the birds are have basically evolved to be these precision instruments of speed and aerodynamics because they are designed for flight. Um, I even often compare them. I say, you know, birds are like the high performance race cars of the animal world, and we are, you know, your basic garden lawnmower um, in terms of how specialized or how sophisticated our systems are. So I could talk for weeks about this, but I won't. I'll just touch on some important things. Flight has driven adaptations, again, across all parts of a bird. So in terms of their physical structure, their physiology, and their life history, um, and there are trade-offs involved. So they get this great benefit of being able to fly, which is probably primarily a way to escape predators. Um, but in, in consequence, they've given up some stuff. So there are a number of physical constraints that they have because they fly. And one of the big ones is when you turn your forelimbs into wings, that leaves you with no hands with which to manipulate things. So we see birds have had to come up with creative ways of carrying things. Um, 
They also have a number of other um, structural adaptations to flight. Probably um, the biggest thing though is their physiology. So again, high performance race cars, right? They're Physiology is incredibly efficient. They have a very fast metabolism with body temperatures of 105 on average. Um, so they run very hot. They have a high pressure circulatory system. It's all about getting that energy circulated to the flight muscles to sustain that, um, you know, the energetic expensive flight. Their um, respiratory system is incredibly sophisticated. They've got rigid one directional lungs, so they don't waste any time with having oxygen depleted air in their lungs. It's always um, the oxygen rich air flowing over the lung tissue and oxygenating the blood. Um, they also do some pretty extreme things for water conservation because water is heavy and you don't want to be carrying heavy stuff around if you're flying. So they're incredibly good at conserving water. Um, so that imposes a lot of energetic constraints. They need to eat a lot. They need to bring in a lot of energy really efficiently in order to support this lifestyle. Um, they also have some constraints associated with their life history. Um, so because their body temperatures are so hot, they don't have the option, even if it was an evolutionary option for them, um, of raising or of having their young develop internally. They have to produce these eggs pretty fast and get them out of their bodies because temperatures of 105 are way too hot to support viable en embryos. So they have to deposit their eggs somewhere and have them um, be pretty place bound during the breeding season. Also because of the energetic requirements for the adult and for growing young, uh, they tend to be restricted to pretty small family sizes, especially for our, our, um, our seabirds. So caring for young is expensive. It usually takes two parents to do it. Um, yeah. So there's a number, number of different constraints that are direct consequences of this flighted lifestyle. So why is it important to understand all these constraints? It means that the birds um, may be functioning pretty close to their physical and energetic limits, especially during the breeding season when not only they're keeping themselves alive, they're also trying to rear chicks. Um, so they all probably don't have a lot of leeway in the decisions that they make. So they only have so many options if, you know, trouble arises in the system. There's only so many ways they can respond. And that actually makes it easier for us uh, when we see changes in behavior and population dynamics to make connections to things happening in the larger ecosystem. If we're thinking about seabirds in particular, and I will talk about what I mean by seabirds versus marine birds in a moment, um, they have a, an additional constraint in that they do this, they have to breed on land. Again, their they're young have to have a place to develop on dry land, um, but they feed at sea. And in fact, if you look in the sort of seabird Bible, the textbook uh, that we all go by, there's a great quote that says, the one common characteristic that all seabirds share is that they feed in salt water, dot, 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 but as seems to be true with any statement in biology, some do not. Um, so here's our, our gull again. Well, it's a different species, but anyway, I always thought that was a cute quote because yeah, there are these things that we call seabirds and we try to define them by this lifestyle, but there, there are always exceptions. And it turns out that the, um, there are birds that we consider to be seabirds in lots of different lineages. So when we use the term seabirds, we're talking about penguins, uh, things like albatross and shearwaters, gannets and cormorants and pelicans, um, gulls, terns, those kinds of things. Um, and, and when we look, um, I'm gonna skip ahead here for a second. We can see that in this sort of bird family tree, these are the seabirds I've circled in red. We can see that this lifestyle has actually arisen separately in different lineages. Um, so it's not a feature that all these guys inherited from a common ancestor. Um, it's a, a lifestyle that has developed. Um, they do have some other shared characteristics, uh, including a salt gland, which is for um, excreting the extra salt that you take in when you drink seawater. Um, and also interestingly, they do colonial breeding, which in itself is somewhat rare among birds. If you look at all birds, only 13% actually breed together in dense colonies. But when you look at just the birds that we've identified as seabirds, 
95% of those species do the colonial breeding. So that seems like an important, um, there's an important link to the seabird lifestyle there. Um, and it also makes our job a little easier later on, you will see. All right. So um, if we think about that lifestyle of breeding on land, feeding at sea, there are actually some other um, birds that should qualify, but don't just by convention. So um, you can think of things like phalaropes and sea ducks and even to some extent loons and greaves as uh, breeding on land, but then at least at some points in the year um, using the, the ocean as a, as a food source. So these are what I kind of collectively term as marine birds. Uh, so it's a little bit more inclusive than, than seabirds. All right, so given all this, how can seabirds or marine birds help us understand the ocean? So because birds are essentially the top predators, I've circled them here in my food web, they're the top predators in um, ocean food webs, which means there's nothing in the ocean that specializes on feeding on seabirds. Um, they may get incidentally eaten now and then, but within the actual ocean food web, they're the top. Um, so because they are top predators, they actually, integrate the effects of changes in marine systems. So um, all the way down to the physics that are driving these food chains, all the way through the food chain itself, uh, changes that happen at any of these levels can often be reflected in, in the birds. Um, and while they're not the only organisms to do this, certainly our predatory fish are, uh, can also be considered the top of marine food chains, uh, birds are a lot easier to observe than most of those other options. So um, let's see. So how can they help us understand the ocean? If you're thinking about it from the perspective of a bird, um, they actually cruise pretty vast stretches of the ocean. So again, here we have a, basically a big blue blank slate for us. We can see a little um, turn down here. I've circled him in yellow or her, and this is gonna be a little video and we can watch. Um, so the bird is traveling over what looks like a big empty blue field to me, uh, and something is alerting it to uh, dive, uh, presumably after prey. So they're visually covering a huge landscape and they're really keying in on where particular resources are, is what I want you to get out of this video. All right, so that's enough of it. Next slide. All right. So um, if we step back and we look at all the different tracking studies that have been done, where we've actually affixed um, tags to birds and watched where they went in the ocean, each one of these little dots represents a position that a bird was recorded at um, through these remote tracking devices. And these are all different species. So a bunch of researchers have put their data all together. And this is actually quite a few years old now. So uh, I bet it's even more filled in now. Uh, you can see they cover most of the ocean. Um, so that's pretty impressive, <clears throat> but they're covering a lot of territory is where I'm going with that. Um, depending on the season, each population can be sampling some pretty predictable regions in that larger space as well. So we talked about during the breeding season, they've got to stay close to their chicks. Um, so they'll be staying within some reasonable commuting distance, which is going to vary by species, um, but is fairly predictable. Um, but they've got to stay within commuting distance of their breeding site. So we know, for example, if a puffin comes back to a colony with a particular fish, we know, um, relatively speaking, the region of the ocean that that fish came from. It's within some certain commuting range around the colony. So that allows us to make connections to specific regions of the ocean. Um, often birds are foraging on things that are interesting to us. So either um, forage fish that commercially important fish are also feeding on, or they may be feeding on sort of younger life stages of some of our commercially important fish. Um, so again, like many valuable species in the ocean, birds are top predators. So um, they're a good, they're sampling the fish that we're interested in, in knowing about in a lot of cases. And then what they do is they, because they're 95% of them are colonial, they're bringing these fish back to the breeding colonies where we often have pretty easy access to them. So this is an example of a kittiwake colony uh, that I worked at in Alaska. Oops, that's another little video if I can get it to play. 
Yes, we'll hear the sound of the birds. You can see the researchers collecting the data that the birds have been bringing back, like from dark samples and other information. So that's a, another, you know, handy thing about birds. So it turns out there's a lot of different aspects of marine bird breeding biology that we can measure, and each one tells us something slightly different about the system. So for example, and these are just three examples, there's plenty more, but we can look at egg production, um, which is a good indication of early season prey availability. So if there's lots of food out there in within range of the colony, uh, birds can produce more eggs. Um, if we look a little later in the season, once the chicks are around, we can actually, um, you know, carefully intercept some um, and actually sample the fish that the adults are bringing back. We have to be really careful not to do it so much, um, do it more than once to a particular chick. We have to be thoughtful about depriving it of needed nutrition, but um, we can actually get the fish in hands. We can do things like identify the species, get the length. We can assess fish health if it's in good shape. Um, so that's kind of a way of directly sampling fish. Uh, we can look at less direct measures like chick growth. So if chicks are growing fast, that means they're getting a lot of food. They're getting a lot of high quality food often. Um, so the key point is that when there are changes in the prey base, they're often going to affect seabird breeding biology, which is um, for some species more than others, but it can be pretty easy to study. All right, um, and then lastly, uh, we can find out different information from different species because they're actually sampling different habitats within the ocean. So if we think of something like our puffins, um, they're pretty good at diving. They get a lot of their food from sort of the benthic region. Here are some sand lance, my cobbled together graphic. Um, they're not traveling huge distances from their colonies, but they're getting, uh, they're, they're able to dive down fairly deep and sample things going on from deeper waters. If you think of things like gulls and terns, they may be able to travel a little further, but they're really only sampling the very surface of the water, so different habitat. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have things like albatross, which um, can travel thousands of miles just on one feeding trip to bring home food for their chicks. They can dive a little deeper than typical gulls and terns, but they're definitely not getting down to the bottom of the ocean. So again, um, depending on your species, it's going to tell you things about different parts of the, the marine system, different habitats within it. All right. So given all this and all the stuff I haven't mentioned, uh, what have we learned? So I'm just going to hit a few highlights, um, a few examples. So um, first off, when we look at actual diet data, so what fish are, um, are the birds bringing back or what fish are they consuming, we see that um, these data can actually indicate when there are going to be imminent changes in fish populations. So in this graph here, um, these white dots represent the, the proportion or the percent of sardine in diets of uh, several different seabird species combined. And the black dots indicate sardine um, catches, so CPUE, uh, catch per unit effort uh, for fishing boats, fishing for sardines. And we can see in a lot of cases um, where the sardine fishery had a, a rapid drop, that was um, predicted, I guess, by the uh, sardine in the bird diets. So several years before uh, the fishery felt in effect, the birds were already showing us um, that you know something was going on. And I suspect this is because the fish, the birds were eating the fish at a younger stage than the fishery um, was collecting. So again, they were showing us that there wasn't going to be great recruitment. Um, so that's one example. Um, so looking at diet data directly can indicate what's going on or what's about to happen in uh, the fishing industry. Um, we can also look um, not directly at diets, but actually at bird population trends. And we can see that they often mirror or even in some cases foreshadow changes in fish populations. So this is an example um, of cormorant and anchovy populations that are pretty tightly linked uh, because anchovies are a, a pretty important food source for Cape cormorants in, in South Africa. 
So on a larger scale, uh, we see across the globe that seabird populations responds to uh, forage fish depletion at, at kind of a, a threshold level. So um, when the forage fish population declines to about one third of its normal size, that's when we really see uh, seabird populations start to decline. So if we start seeing you know, widespread declines in birds that are foraging in the same, on the same resources, that's a good indication um, or a good red flag that we should look a little more carefully at what's going on with the forage fish. Um, and because of this, there are actually a number of systems or a number of uh, management efforts that involve marine bird data. So for example, in the South Atlantic, uh, managers are using different seabird diet and breeding performance metrics as a representation of krill abundance. And that helps um, decide how to, how to manage the system down there. In the Northwest Atlantic, similarly, um, managers are using mer diets as a representation of capelin abundance. That's a um, high latitude forage fish. Um, then in the North Sea, uh, they're looking at breeding performance of two different gull species as an indicator of general ecosystem function that feeds into sort of management decisions. So those are just some examples of how we are actually using uh, marine bird information in helping to manage ocean resources. Um, what else have we learned? So um, you may have heard in the news periodically over the past few decades of large scale uh, bird die-offs. So this was a particularly bad one. So in the winter of 2013, um, the first indication that we had that there was something going on in the Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska ecosystem uh, was that all of these starved myrrh carcasses were washing up on beaches. Um, and it turned out that that was linked to this uh, sort of climate event that was going on. So the waters were a lot warmer than they um, traditionally are. And that was uh, basically disrupting the, the food chain to the point where MERS weren't able to get the food they needed to survive the winter. Um, so we know that marine die-offs can often indicate some really big ecosystem scale environmental changes that would be uh, good to be alerted to. Um, and we see lots of different examples of that. I've just thrown um, a few papers here um, with different examples of links between seabird populations or marine bird populations and um, climate events or combinations of climate events and, and prey depletions. All right, on a larger scale, um, the, when we look at sort of, well, this particular paper looked at all seabird populations that have been monitored or that are being monitored between 1950 and, and 2010. And they suggest that there's been a 70% decline sort of globally in seabird populations. Uh, the, the number itself is a little controversial, but the trend, um, the trend is probably pretty real. Um, so globally, that feels like a red flag about uh, when we're thinking about the state of our oceans, especially when we understand the links between seabird populations and, and climate and, and prey. So I don't wanna end on a downer note though. So I wanna talk about some other cool things that birds can tell us about marine ecosystems. So remember uh, these birds are traveling all over the oceans. And remember I talked about how expensive it is for us to get boats to some of these regions. Um, so what happens if we attach some of our instrumentation to birds? So this is something that um, we obviously have to do carefully and we never wanna be um, putting devices on birds that are you know, gonna to be too burdensome. Um, so there, there's a lot of effort to kind of um, make sure we're doing this responsibly, but uh, the implications are, are pretty cool. Um, and the things we've been able to do are, are pretty cool. Uh, so there's various different devices I've thrown on the slide here. So this here is an example of a temperature depth recording tag that you can put on a diving bird. That again, remember satellites only are measuring the very surface of the water, but birds are diving, or especially the diving birds are. Um, so by having temperature depth recorders on diving birds, we can actually find out a lot about the water column. Um, 
than we can from satellites. So that's cool. This cormorant is carrying a salinity tag. Um, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, there are other devices that we can put on birds as well. Uh, so there are other animals that we attach things to for sure. Um, and things like marine mammals and big fish can carry larger instruments, um, which is cool, uh, but they don't cover nearly as much sort of ocean real estate compared to um, how fast and far birds can travel. Uh, so there are definitely trade-offs with each group. So here are some examples of things we've learned from um, bird-borne sensors. So this was an early study um, where they actually used birds to validate some of that, that satellite data. So they put a sea surface temperature or a temperature um, thermometer on a bird on birds, and uh, we're able to tell. Um, okay, when the bird was at this particular position, this was the temperature. How does that compare to what the satellite gave us for that particular? patch of ocean. Um, so that's a really cool application. Um, our cormorant with a salinity tag was actually part of an effort along with tagged seals to come up with a pretty high resolution map of the Columbia River estuary, um, the depth and the sort of salinity profile. Uh, here's another cool one where they were able to use very precise position me measurements. Um, from tagged birds to actually map out really fine scale wind speed and direction patterns um, in you know, an ocean environment. So those are some cool examples of um, what we can learn from bird borne sensors. And again, I wanna say that it's something we need to do responsibly and make sure we're not overburdening birds, um, but the, the applications are pretty cool. All right. so. Got to the end here. So my take home messages, hopefully, um, are that you now have a greater appreciation for how tremendously important marine systems are, but also how tremendously difficult they are to study. Um, marine systems are shaped by this complex interplay of environmental and biological factors. Birds do have some great potential to serve as indicators, and in fact, they are being used to serve as indicators for these complex and really difficult to observe systems, um, especially when we use them in combination with other information sources, and that's just a, a good general rule to follow when we do anything. We want uh, multiple streams of information when we make decisions. And while the messages they are giving us can be a little disheartening. Um, the positive side is, you know, being forewarned is forearmed, um, especially when we're talking about large scale oceanic changes. All right, so circling back to this image again, um, I'm wondering for, for any of you who had sort of a negative reaction to the picture of these gulls, these are black-legged kittiwakes, um, if your perspective has changed at all. So, all right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now, I think. Thank you so much, Allie. We appreciate that presentation. Um, folks, I invite you now, if you have any questions for uh, Dr. Allie McKnight, to please type them into the Q&A uh, box that is located on your toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And also, if you have any resources or anything you'd like to share with us and the rest of the audience, you can type that into the chat box. Um, I'm gonna, gonna dive right in, Allie. We already have a, a question here. Um, this is from an anonymous attendee, and they would like to know a little bit more about the Gulf of Maine and, you know, the fact that it is so quickly warming and it is changing uh, what's living in there, which is obviously food for seabirds. Can you talk about um, how the warming of the Gulf of Maine is going to affect the seabird population in Maine and the marine bird population in Maine? Uh, you're right. So the Gulf of Maine is actually... Um, kind of climate change ground zero for ocean systems. It's warming faster than I think like 98% of marine systems across the globe. Um, and that has a lot to do with changing circulation patterns. There are people who can answer the seabird question a lot better than I can. Um, I don't have a lot of direct um, experience lately with working on with the sea, our seabird populations in the Gulf of Maine, but yes, they're definitely um, there are changes that are affecting birds. Um, okay, yes, and if anyone has any particular information that you'd like to share about that uh, topic, you can go ahead and type it into the chat box if there's any uh, seabird or marine bird experts out there. Um, 
And <laughs> again, we're, we're getting lots of questions about the link between seabird and lobster <laughs> population specifically. Uh, so if anyone wants to chime in about that, that would be great. Uh, yeah, I, I can go I ahead. Mean, yeah, there's not a lot. Yeah. <laughs> It's interesting. Um, the Gulf of Maine has not always had as many lobsters as it does. Um, the system used to be dominated by predatory fish. Um, and now um, a lot of the predatory fish populations are diminished. We have this great um, economic resource of lobsters. Um, I imagine that things were different for seabirds back when we had a lot more big predatory fish. For one thing, if you think about those, the birds that are foraging on the surface, they're really reliant on prey coming up to the surface where they can get it. Um, so often when we see forage flocks, there'll be mixed species and you'll see diving birds in there. And the diving birds actually seem to be forcing the you know forage fish up to the surface. And that's when the terns and gulls can get at them. And I imagine back when there were a lot more predatory fish around, the fish were kind of helping that process a little more, but that's just my my little take on it, um, and not really related to that question, but it, it made me think of it. So <laughs> no problem. Thank you. We appreciate the insights. Um, <laughs> Sandy wants to know if you have any thoughts uh, about the stellar sea eagle being in the stellar area. Yes. Well, um, I have yet to see the stellar sea eagle. It's definitely on the list. Um, it's a species I've always wanted to see. Um, I think it's up in. Canada now, right? Um, oh, I'm not sure. I, I, normally it fills my uh, social media feed. I know. But I, I haven't seen an update lately. <laughs> One of my students said it was, it made it to Nova Scotia or somewhere, but oh, cool. it's just okay. hearsay. Um, yeah, so I mean, there are always oddballs in every species. So a lot of times when we see an unusual bird, it's um, it's maybe a younger inexperienced bird or it's one that's behaving differently for some, for some reason. Um, it's not one bird isn't necessarily, you know, a harbinger of any, an, of anything. It's just, you know, an, a really interesting opportunity to see something we don't usually see. Um, but it is cool, and I encourage everybody to get out and see it. Um, they're definitely pretty spectacular. Yes, it's just a bit of a rebel that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I have a question myself, and it kind of uh, harkens back to um, what you were talking about at the beginning of the program when we were talking about. Um, uh, marine systems in general. Can you tell me a little bit more about uh, what causes the eddies in the currents? That was something I wasn't really familiar with. I had no like idea. Yes, yeah, so what causes those? Uh, yeah, that's the Coriolis effect. So it's just a consequence of the fact we are on a spinning ball in space mm -hmm. and there's water on the surface. Um, yeah, so as the earth is rotating, <laughs> I always have to think about rotating versus revolving. Um, it's basically rotating under the water. So um, it's causing these very cool circular patterns in water circulation at really big scales um, mm. over longer periods of time. Um, but yeah. Very neat. Yeah, I, I would love to look into that a little bit more. I had never seen it graphically displayed the way you did. I really appreciated that. Um, mm. And this is this one is more about marine birds and seabirds in particular. Uh, I don't know very much about um, eye anatomy at all, um, but ha you were talking about evolution, and and uh, I wanted to know: Have marine birds and seabirds' eyes developed somehow differently from other birds, so that they have this ability to see well um, from flight above down below into the sea surface or below the sea surface? It's a really good question. Um, I imagine like other groups, some are better at it than others. Um, I do know just in general, bird color vision is much more sophisticated than ours. Um, and that's a consequence of the fact um, that our ancestors went through kind of a nocturnal phase. Um, so we actually lost the great color vision that, uh, you know, reptiles started us off with. Um, birds never lost it. So they have the more advanced uh, color vision system. Uh, we've kind of cobbled together a replacement, but um, yeah, it's a good question um, about their eye structure. I don't have a great answer. <laughs> no problem. I will. I, the next time we have a bird expert on, I will ask about that. I'll be the uh, yeah. File that one. <laughs> the one with the um, the bird eye anatomy question. Yep. <laughs> um, Catherine wants to know: Is climate change having an effect on ocean salinity? Yes, complex effects. So as 
um, as ice is melting, as like the polar ice caps and um, icebergs are melting, they create, you know, pools of cool, fresh water in the ocean system. Um, and yep, that, that affects the salinity. Uh, in other areas, as water evaporates from the surface of, you know, salt water, the salt, remaining salt gets, you know, more concentrated. So in some areas, patches of water are getting fresher. In some areas, they're getting more salty. Um, like anything in the ocean, it's complex. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Allie. That covers all the questions that did come in this evening. Um, and I wanted to remind folks out there, thank you so much for coming. Uh, again, this was another program in our brand new series that is called Wild Maine. And that is in partnership with the Center for Wildlife Studies. And please uh, check them out. You can find them um, at centerforwildlifestudies.org. And I know they'd appreciate your support. Um, certainly visit them, learn more about their mission and some of their other programs. And speaking of programs, with them. Um, please keep an eye out on their website and ours because coming up in the summer, we're going to have some opportunities for some in-person programs, um, including some walks around Camden um, talking about the plants and wildlife. So it should be great. Um, I also want to mention that the library is celebrating Maritime Month. So we have a lot of great maritime um, sea-inspired programming coming up uh, all throughout April. Please visit librarycamden.org and the What's Happening calendar, and you can find all of it and opportunities to sign up for your Zoom link. Um, all right, Allie, thank you so much. This was a thank very you. interesting, very informative program. Thank you for the work that you do. This is an important subject matter that you're studying. Um, and we appreciate your hard work and your help spread the word about it. Thanks. Good night, everyone. See you again soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>